On behalf of the UC Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, I'm glad to welcome you to today's lecture by Denis Lacorn, uh, The Secular State and Religious Tolerance. I'm David Hollinger of the History Department. I'm one of the founding faculty members of the center and a friend of Lacorn's for 25 years. The Tolerance Lecture is an annual event here at Berkeley run by the center funded by a generous endowment, the Endowment Fund for the Study of Religious Tolerance. This annual lecture is a distinguished one of which we're very proud. Among the recent holders of this lectureship have been Michael Walzer and David Nirenberg and a number of other prominent figures in the discussion of religion and tolerance. Uh, Denis Lacorn's record <clears throat> as a historian, uh, political scientist and social theorist makes him ideally qualified to be this year's uh, tolerance lecture here for our center. Uh, his most recent book, The Limits of Tolerance is exactly on this topic. And it is a detailed discussion of issues in tolerance as engaged by various regimes throughout the history of the North Atlantic West and of the Middle East. Uh, Denis has long been interested in relationship between ethno-religious groups, different identity groups, and uh, uh, political regimes of various sorts. He's also had a distinguished career studying the dynamics of identity formation and perpetuation. And uh, among his many books, I particularly want to call attention to this one, uh, Religion in America, which <clears throat> along with some of his other works touching on the United States, have made Lacorn into uh, the most prominent French voice now speaking uh, about the United States and about the political culture and the history of the United States. Uh, Lacorn has spent most of his career in Paris, where he's been a, uh, a research professor for many decades at Sciences Po, but he's also spent a lot of time in the United States, living here from time to time, and he did his PhD at Yale University. Uh, he's a frequent visitor to California, and I'm very glad to welcome him again here to Berkeley. Uh, before I turn the screen over to Denis, I, know I want to explain that our drill today on questions and answers is that you're to write your questions uh, into the screen. There's a thing at the bottom of your screen, Q&A, that should give you an opportunity to write something down. And if you have questions, that's the place to write them. And then after Denis has finished his lecture, uh, I'll check in again and read some of the questions to, uh, to Denis. Uh, with that, Denis Lacorn. Well, thank you very much, um, David. It's a pleasure to, to see you again. Uh, and I haven't been back to Berkeley in a very, very long time. Uh, many years ago, I gave a talk at, at the uh, uh, Institute of Governmental Studies, but that, that was maybe 20 or 25 years ago. So it's a great honor for me to, to be back to Berkeley and, and, and give that lecture. Uh, the Secular State and Religious Tolerance. Let me start with a definition of secularism. What do I mean by the secular state? Uh, and I'll start with a simple definition of what in France we call laïcité, which is often translated as secularism, but doesn't quite mean the same uh, thing. Uh, I would argue that the United States is a secular republic, but in, uh, at the same time, in a deeply religious society. Uh, whereas France is a secular republic in a deeply non-religious society, which used to be dominated by the Catholic Church, but today um, is, is not a terribly religious society. And in fact, the most visible religions in today's France are the religion of the newly arrived immigrants, uh, namely evangelicals, Pentecostals from sub-Saharan sub Africa uh, and Muslims from both Turkey and North Africa and also sub-Saharan Africa. And those migrants are often criticized because they are, quote, visible religion. Uh, they're not discreet. Uh, they're often openly proselytizing, which 
by the way, is no longer the way of the Catholic Church in France today. It used to be, but it's not really the case today with a few exceptions. So is state secularism compatible with a deeply religious society? Is it compatible with religious tolerance? Uh, does it, is it conducive to religious tolerance? I think it all depends on the historical context. In the United States, uh, which I, I claim is really a secular republic by its foundation, uh, this republic, the American Republic was not built against religion. It only opposed established churches like the Anglican Church in Virginia or the Dutch Reformed Church in uh, what uh, was called then the New Netherlands before becoming New York and, and New Jersey. In France, laicite, secularism, was uh, built, in fact, against the Catholic Church. But you have to remember that in France, the Catholic Church up to the early 1900s was opposed to Republican constitutional institutions and uh, was still pushing for a possible restoration of the monarchy. Uh, it's also a church which did not accept until very recently, in fact, the concept of uh, freedom of conscience. And yet, despite those differences, historical differences, there are striking similarities between uh, the French and the American secularism. They are both based, I would say, on a key principle, which is the separation of church and state. And this was well understood by uh, one of the leading architect of the French laicite, Ferdinand Brisson, who uh, as early as 1887, uh, in his uh, Dictionnaire de Pédagogie, uh, dictionnaire uh, uh, said, invented, in fact, uh, laicite. In the dictionary, you had an article called Laicite, 1887, and applied it to the secular state. And here is very shortly his definition of laicite. A secular state, says Brisson, is laic when, quote, uh, it's a state that is a state neutral with regard to all form of worship independent of all clergies, free from any theological views. And this very abstract definition works in fact pretty well, I would say for both France and the United States. Today, the debate about the secular state concerns the extent to which uh, religious symbol are uh, present, should be allowed in the public square. Should they be tolerated, should they banned or even restricted, do religious symbols threaten the neutrality of the uh, secular state. And uh, let me pursue the comparison between France and the United States, and then we'll move to other countries. Um, quick reminder, you know, Article 6 of the American Constitution says the following, quote, no religious test shall ever be required for qualification to any office under the United States. And in France, and another Article 6 of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, quote, all citizens being equal in the eyes of the law are equally eligible to all public positions, end quote. Or again, to compare the uh, first paragraph of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Uh, and in France, you have the uh, first article of the current Constitution, the Constitution of the Fifth Republic, quote, France shall respect all beliefs. Or again, we can go back to 1789, the Declaration of uh, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, quote, no one shall be troubled for his opinions, including his religious views, provided their manifestation does not disturb the public order established by law. And I want to stress the point manifestation, that means that religion in France can be visible in the public sphere, manifestation. And in many ways, as argued by uh, Zoller, Elizabeth Zoller, a French um, constitutional scholar, France, quote, is the daughter of Jefferson as the United States is the heir of Voltaire. Surprising statement, I would say, which needs further explanation. Is France the daughter of Jefferson? Uh, here's a possible answer. It has to do with the French elite's tremendous admiration 
for Jefferson's bill for establishing religious freedom, which Jefferson wrote in 1779, and which thanks to uh, Madison's lobbying, in fact, became law in Virginia in uh, 1786. Um, in this bill, Jefferson attacked uh, the legislature um, for um, um, attempts to quote, I, I quote Jefferson, to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves and abhors, end quote. He described Jefferson, this practice as sinful and tyrannical. And Jefferson famously added, our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions any more than our opinions in physics and geometry, end quote. And, and later, in a famous letter to the uh, um, uh, Danbury Baptist Association, Jefferson will explain his own understanding of the First Amendment uh, that was before Marbury versus Madison, so no one knew what the Supreme Court would say about it. And he said in his own reading of the First Amendment, uh, Madison insisted that he created, quote, the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause, a great wall of separation between church and state, end quote. And there's a whole debate, great wall, where does that come from? Some have argued it's Roger Williams, others uh, have, have argued it's really uh, uh, James Berg, a, a radical will in, in Britain, who had written a book called Crito, which was uh, widespread uh, reading in, in the 18th century. So is a uh, second question, the United States, the heir of Voltaire? Here's the evidence is a little less direct, but it's clear that uh, the founding fathers and Madison in particular, were quite familiar with the writings of uh, Voltaire and other enlightenment thinkers like Montesquieu, Diderot and Volney and Demonier. And Madison in his correspondence often cited Voltaire's famous statement about the danger of a, a religious tyranny derived from a religious establishment. Remember, we are, we are in, on the context of anti-establishment um, politics. And I quote Voltaire, if there is only one religion in England, there will be danger of despotism. But there are two, if there are two religions, they would cut each other's throats but there are 30 and they live in peace and happiness. And that's Voltaire in his letter on the Presbyterians in his philosophical letters. Now you can find a, a, an interesting echo of that statement in Federalist number 10, where Madison compares religious sects with sex, meaning church at the time, with political factions, faction meant political party at the time as well in the 18th century. And I cite here, Madison Federalist stand, quote, a religious sect may degenerate into a political faction, meaning a dominant or tyrannical faction in a part of the Confederacy, but the variety of sects dispersed over the entire face of it must secure the national council against any danger from that source, end quote. In sum, the larger the union, the greater the number of sects and the least likely the risk of a religious tyranny, uh, the same re reasoning applying to political parties. So let me now consider the present. The real controversy today is about, uh, I would argue, the, 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 the presence of religious object in the public square. It's a debate, which is a debate about the nature of secularism. Uh, as it functions in France and the United States, secularism can be both inclusive or exclusive. It is inclusive if it permits the presence of religious symbols on the ground that those symbols are maybe neutral, not in fact religious. It is exclusive if it prohibits those symbols on the grounds that they challenge the core values of the society in which they are displayed. Hence the two parts of my talk on the one hand, tolerant secularism, on the other, intolerant secularism. So let me start with tolerant secularism. Now in, in um, French, uh, in, the US media often portray the French laicite of French secularism in very negative terms uh, as something which is quite hostile to religion and, and many of its manifestations. And yet 
this hostility, which is real in the case of the prohibition of Muslim uh, dressing code, uh, the hijab, the niqab, the burqa, the burkini, uh, uh, it's true, but it's um, also uh, in the French case, it's more complicated, more complex, because you also have tolerance of other religious symbols, such as nativity scenes in the public square. So let me start with that, that example of crash or nativity scenes. Uh, there's a law, 1905 law in France that separates church and state. It's called the law separating church and state. It prohibits the display of all religious symbols on all public lands and all public buildings. Well, that's the 1905 law. That's strict, you know, firm, strong laicite, if you wish. But that law preserves already existing religious structures and makes an exception for graveyards, religious ceremonies, or religious buildings. So uh, the whole debate today about nativity scenes in French cities remain pretty controversial and administrative tribunals uh, have in the past often prohibited uh, the building of nativity scenes on a public site, which would be a city hall or public square uh, in front of the city hall. But there's been an interesting change recently a change uh, suggesting a move toward a more tolerant society, suggesting that French um, uh, authorities could, uh, oh, let me put it differently. The, the problem lies um, in the meaning of a nativity scene, uh, which could have several signifiers, I would argue. It could either be a strictly religious one, the birth of Christ, the foundation of Christianity, or the other signifier is that, well, it's predominantly cultural meaning. A crash is a work of art, an artistic display of figurines built by local artisans. In that case, a crash is more than religious. It is a symbol of culture and tradition. So in principle, if one follows the law that I just mentioned, the law of 1905, no exception is tolerated. If the crash appears as what it is, a religious symbol, and implicitly an act of religious proselytizing. But this narrow meaning, reading of the true meaning of, of, of the crash is slowly changing as demonstrated by two a very interesting decision of the Conseil d'Etat, which is the highest administrative court in France. Uh, uh, those are two 2016 decision concerning uh, the building of a crash in uh, Vendée in the, uh, the general council building of the Vendée, which is a major state institution. And um, in the first case, uh, the argument of that court was that the display of the birth of Christ was in fact a neutral event. Uh, it did not endorse a particular religion. It simply acknowledged its existence and placed it in an ancient tradition whose real meaning was cultural, uh, much more than religious, and included strong secular elements. You, you had not just a crash, but also a Christmas tree, also uh, special gifts given to public employees. And, uh, and so the crash was much more than a crash. It was a commemoration of a uh, fête de fin d'année, an annual holiday that uh, in fact attracted people from many different faiths and many different backgrounds, irrespective of faith and social background in a way. On the other hand, at the other decision also taken by this top administrative court, invalidated the construction of, of, of a crash in the hallway of, of another city, the city of Merlin, on the grounds that it was a kind of a new initiative. There was no tradition there. There was uh, no special circumstances. And since it was a violation of laicite, it had to be removed. So what are we to make of this contradiction? Calves, Gwenel Calves, a, 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 a very good French professor of public law, has insisted that the first decision is really the important one. It signals in France a shift of direction, a fundamental change in the French secular tradition. It reveals the emergence of a, I quote her, a new neutrality doctrine, 
according to which religious symbols can be transformed into symbols of tradition, identity, and even living together, irrespective of their religious content. And in other words, if you want this new neutrality doctrine, secularizes the religious. It makes it an object of memory, the commemoration of a Christian past in a society, society which is profoundly de-Christianized today. Um, in any case, the religious aspect of the native scene is, is indeed a knowledge, but it is not endorsed. Uh, it's part of a uh, old cultural tradition. And it, it is something that some French sociologists, particularly Portier and, and, and Villem, have called a kind of new laicite of recognition. Now, let me consider the American example of comparison. There's no federal law that prohibits religious monuments in the public square, but uh, there are limitations and those limitations come from the establishment clause. Uh, in a key Supreme Court decision, Lynch versus Donnelly, uh, Donnelly uh, 1984, uh, which concerned a crash set up in a shopping center in the city of, of Portucket, Portucket uh, Rhode Island. The court validated the presence of the nativity scene. And the argument which was um, introduced by late Justice O'Connor was the following. Indeed, the crash is a symbol of Christianity, you cannot deny it. And it was not diminished by the presence of secular symbols, a reindeer, a clown, an elephant, a teddy bear. But the crash was not neutralized by the setting. It was much more, she said, than a Christian event. It celebrated a public holiday and was surrounded by, quote, very strong secular components, analogous to a museum setting where you could have religious paintings with the Virgin Mary, Christ, and so on, uh, that are displayed, but it's clearly understood that they do not represent an endorsement of religion, except if you visit the Bible Museum in, in Washington, DC, but that's something else. It's not a real museum. O'Connor was not redefining the concept of government neutrality in insisting that the only type of endorsement that is not acceptable is that, I quote her, that which sends a message to non-Christians that they are outsiders, not full member of the political community. Uh, which is a, a way of saying uh, a mild endorsement is okay if it is attenuated by secular elements and a larger event, an annual holiday. Uh, uh, and so all of that makes it perfectly acceptable. Now you may criticize that logic, but uh, it, it's an interesting approach. Let me now consider a third example of transformed laicite, which pushes the boundaries of religious tolerance to the limit in a most um, interesting way. And that has to do with Italy and uh, the, uh, the fact that you have crucifixes, crosses in a classroom in Italy, in all the public schools in Italy. So the debate was, well, is that acceptable? You know, if, you, if your parents or, or the child is not religious or is not a Christian, uh, is not uncomfortable to have crucifix in the classroom. Um, now, Italy, you may not know that, despite the fact that uh, the presence of the Vatican, but the Vatican today is an independent state. Italy is a secular country. Uh, which like France recognizes the concept of laicite, laicita in Italian. And a law uh, passed in uh, 1985, disestablished the Catholic church, which is no longer a state religion in Italy. And three years later, the top Italian constitutional court went even further in declaring that in fact, laicita is a fundamental constitutional principle. So was the presence of the cross compatible with the European Convention of Human Rights and in particular it's article nine, which concerns freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Uh, very interesting case, which was decided, uh, it's very controversial, but it went up to the European Court of Human Rights Grand Chamber 
the Lao Tse case, Lao Tse versus Italy in, in uh, 2011, and the plaintiffs were Mrs. Lao Tse and her children. So the key question, should we keep those old crucifixes in the classrooms? And hence so, uh, an entire debate on, well, what's the meaning of the cross? Is it primarily a symbol of Christianity, the death of Christ, the announce of, of resurrection, or is it much more for the government, which followed the argument of the highest administrative court, the concilio di stato, the cross no longer was the symbol of a triumphant Christianity. Uh, it was, quote, a passive symbol, end quote, which was fully compatible with the Italian notion of secularism. Laicita in the Italian sense of the term was not equivalent to a totally neutral state indifferent to religions. It was a principle that defended religious liberty within a confessional and cultural framework that was entirely pluralistic. Pluralism, therefore, was the key principle here. Laicita could be understood in Italy as a modern expression of an old Western Christian heritage, uh, which transcended its religious nature in a rather astonishing way. And here's a quote from uh, an Italian tribunal that's taken uh, uh, excerpt from the, the Lao Tse versus Italy case. I quote, now it is obvious that in Italy, the crucifix is capable of expressing symbolically, of course, but appropriately, the religious origin of those values, tolerance, mutual respect, valorization of the person, affirmation of one's rights, human solidarity, and the refusal of any form of discrimination which characterize Italian civilization. It's a remarkable tour de force, I would say. The cross, if you follow that reading, means nothing. It is empty, emptied of its specific theological content. And it means everything. It is a symbol of modern secularized Italian civilization. It affirms all the human rights conquered by the Italians after years of political and religious struggle. The important point again here is the inclusiveness of the Italian system of public education. Uh, the judges considered indeed the following uh, point. What is the likely effect? What is the likely impact of the crucifix on students and their professors in the public school. And the court claims that, in fact, the cross had no effect. The cross quote is genuinely passive uh, because it's not accompanied with a either compulsory teaching of religion, catechism, or any form of proselytizing. The school remains open to all religions. Students, for instance, are allowed to, to wear uh, an Islamic headscarf if they want to, uh, girls. Non-Christian religious events do take place like the uh, uh, events concerning the beginning or the end of Ramadan that can be celebrated in the schools. Non-believers are fully respected and they don't have to take uh, any kind of religious education. In the end, the court concluded the presence of crucifixes in the classroom, quote, does not violate the right of education as defined by the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, let me move to the second part of my talk, which is intolerant secularism. I'd like to consider several examples of what I call intolerant secularism, which gave, in fact, little or no place at all to religious symbols in the public square for reasons that are, I would argue, essentially political. The intolerance almost uh, exclusively targets uh, this intolerance targets the religion of newly arrived immigrants, Muslims essentially from Turkey and North Africa. And what's interesting about it is that uh, this intolerance is never totally frontal, ne never openly anti-religious. It touches instead questions of identity, questions of assimilation. It deals with social values and mobilizes a rhetoric of national consensus based on good manners, dignity, social tradition, and a critical acceptance of what Rousseau would have called the volonté générale, the general will, which is best described today in France or in Belgium as 
uh, the art of living together, the vivre ensemble, the art of living together. The problem with this emphasis on national consensus is that it does not favor inclusiveness and uh, pluralism. Good case in point uh, is a ban on Muslim minarets in Switzerland. Central argument of those who supported the ban, there was a referendum about it that won. Uh, besides the fact that minarets do not fit the traditional charming picture of the small Swiss villages with its uh, church in the middle, uh, is that minaret are, first of all, not essential element of the Muslim faith as long as mosques are allowed to be built. But the ban, it is alleged, does not violate liberal values of religious non-establishment and neutrality. In fact, the ban, uh, the effect of the ban uh, is uh, it's the following. It, it can be quite severe, as argued by French philosopher Cécile Laborde, um, a public ban on minarets unambiguously, uh, unambiguously sends a message of exclusion to Muslims. It places, I quote her, Muslims outside the borders of the imagined Swiss national community, end quote. It makes them realize that they are not full members of the Swiss community. In other words, it stigmatizes them. The same reasoning can be applied to the French, Belgian, and Swiss bands on a full face veil, the niqab and the burqa. Now, veiling one face is not, of course, or not a requirement of the faith. It does not belong to the so-called five pillars of Islam. Uh, it's not even mentioned directly uh, in, the Quran, in the Quran. So what are the arguments that were made to, uh, by different governments to ban the full, full face, full facial veil? The argument in France was that, well, it's not a religious obligation. Uh, and then it, secular values were invoked, such as the dignity of women, on the grounds that this medieval garb was not dignified because either it scared other people in the street uh, or, or constituted an attempt to pr proselytize, uh, moderate, or non practicing Muslims. The ban, it was said, violated the equality of men and women, since only women would wear it, of course. And it was perhaps imposed by men on unwilling women. And above all, the fa full face veil was denounced as a threat to the French cultural norm of fraternity. The veil prevented open face-to-face -face relationship and the ideal of transparent communication within society an ideal which was supposed to be part of the so-called art of vivre ensemble, of living together, uh, developed after years of, of religious conflicts and civil wars in France. In fact, the main reason to ban the full facial veil was, uh, I would argue, political. Conservatives didn't like it. It signaled in their mind the rise of radical Islam and the new immigrants' reluctance to assimilate. On the left, feminists were incensed at the medieval nature of the niqab, often described as a jail for women, a walking cloister, a signal of women's inferiority. Uh, but uh, there was a key legal and constitutional problem. Secularism indeed can be strict, can be exacting, but it cannot reject out of hand a religious practice which, like all religious practice is part recognized by the French constitutional order, namely the right to express one's religion in public and the free exercise of religion. Never forget that Catholic nuns and, and priests or monks do uh, wear special dresses and, and uh, sometimes cover their face um, as well. So faced with this problem, French lawmakers chose to uh, secularized the ban in a way that gave it, uh, gave the ban, the appearance of neutrality. The ban would have nothing to do with religion. It would only target face covering in general from the public space. However, when you look at, at the way the law is applied, 
uh, then it's a different picture. And uh, you have a huge list of exemptions from the ban concerning nurses, uh, traditional Catholic hoods uh, worn in religious processions, painters, dentists, motorcycle riders, fencers, people in carnivals. In fact, if you consider the list of exemptions, only will, uh, Muslim, Muslim women with a burqa or niqab were banned from the street. And uh, in fact, what was disturbing about the ban um, was um, not that the idea itself is, is shocking. I mean, maybe right to not to have full face veil in an airport or in a public administration building, but the ban concerned the public space and gave it a new incredible definition. Uh, the public space as defined by the law banning the full face veil was not just public buildings, schools, theaters, uh, uh, city halls, uh, um, airport, but the public space, uh, a public space that had never really been regulated before, the streets, the parks, the garden, the beaches. Veiled women were banned from the entire public space. Uh, they could be fined for violation of the ban and even arrested if they refused to comply. Uh, the ban was highly controversial in France uh, but the highest court of France, the Constitutional Council, declared that it did not violate the French Constitution. Uh, the ban was also approved by the, the highest European court, the European uh, Court of Human Rights. In that case, the very interesting case, uh, which we should consider, uh, the case is called SAS versus France. SAS are the initials for the name of a young plaintiff claimed that the ban on the niqab, which she wore, depending on her mood, violated the European conventions of human rights, violated her human rights. The French government objected on four different grounds, uh, safety and security of the public, uh, protection of equality and between the sexes, respect of human dignity and respect of this notion which I just mentioned of living together. The European court in its majority opinion only retain the last element of the French argument, the fundamental quote, requirements of living together. Uh, and, and the court claimed there was a valid social choice which a country such as France could impose on its citizens, but it never explained what was truly meant by living together. It gave the French government a large margin of appreciation to define what was meant by the requirements of living together. Now, critics of that decision, uh, and two very interesting critics, are the two dissenting judges in that decision, SES versus France, uh, a German and a Swedish judge, who denounced in that decision its majoritarian bias, the fact that it stigmatized a small religious community whose members did not threaten anyone, who uh, sincerely believed that the full face veil was important to them, even though it was not necessarily a religious obligation. And never forget, I mean, we're talking 300, maybe 800 women at best in total in France, where 8% of the French are uh, Muslim today. The decision, according to the dissenting judges, was a clear violation of the principle of tolerance. It demonstrated, I cite the dissenting judges, a selective pluralism and restricted tolerance, end quote, and concluded that one does not remove the cause tension by eliminating pluralism, but in making sure that competing groups tolerate each other, end quote. In other words, I would say that true tolerance consists in protecting a small, vulnerable, and unpopular minority against the restrictions imposed by the majority. For complex historical reasons, the French secular state is incapable of practicing this type of tolerance. In large part, I would say it can be traced back to the centralist, centralized tradition uh, in French history, the Jacobin centralized tradition, which first evolved under the France of Louis XIV and was perfected by the French Revolution. Dissent uh, 
whether it was cultural, religious, political, has never been easily accepted in France. Multiculturalism today, for instance, is almost an insult in France, a sign of a willingness to refuse the French identity, a dangerous communitarian impulse imported from the United States, uh, the signal of a possible dissolution of the state and impulse for, quote, separatism. That's the latest obsession, political interest. Is that group uh, or that other group, whether religious or not, are trying to separate from the majority. And for this purpose, the French parliament just passed a law this July, very, very recently, a quote, a law, that's the name of the law, reinforcing respect for the principles of the Republic. And that law expands uh, the scope of laicity and targets all religions, <clears throat> not just Islam, but clearly the main target is radical Islam. And <clears throat> it concerns different things concerning uh, home teaching, uh, uh, public funding of religious activities, uh, religious associations would have to sign a charter of Republican values, so on and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's a res very restrictive law. One can find comparable cases of secular intolerance in the United States, but they are relatively rare, I would say, and they may have been better justified. They concern, um, uh, referring to very famous cases that most historians and constitutional scholars know uh, the other ban on polygamy, the Reynolds case in 1878, uh, Mor Mormon uh, polygamy, the ban on the use of peyote in religious ceremonies, the employment division versus Smith, the 1990 decision, uh, a, a ban concerning uh, the wearing of the Yarmulka in the Air Force, um, Goldman versus Weinberger, 1986 case. But there's no ban on Muslim religious dress in the United States. Uh, Islamic veils are accepted in schools and public buildings and airports and city halls in a Congress. You can even pledge allegiance on a Quran, not a Bible, but the Quran as Keith Ellison and, and others have done. Critics of the decision invoked several constitutional uh, amendment. Um, uh, why? Because the most recent and uh, perhaps the most serious prohibition imposed on a religious minority in the United States is uh, Trump's, President Trump's 2017 proclamation, which banned the entry in the United States of residents from predominantly Muslim countries. Uh, and there were about 10 countries, I think. Now, critics of that decision said, uh, which was called the Muslim ban, um, said uh, that decision stigmatized a religious minority. It violated state neutrality. But Supreme Court here intervened and ruled otherwise in a recent 5-4 decision, Trump versus Hawaii, June 2018. Now, for Chief Justice Roberts, which delivered the opinion of the court, the president's proclamation did not signal a systematic hostility to Islam. It only targeted countries represented Robert's argument. 8% of the world's Muslim population. The ban did not violate the establishment clause for the target wasn't religion per se, but something else, said Roberts, justifying an important government interest, namely the something else is national security. So uh, it was not the establishment clause that was at stake. And as in the European case that I just talked about earlier, SAS versus France, uh, it's also worth considering here in Trump versus Hawaii, the opinion of the dissenting justices. Uh, in fact, the, the dissents are comparable. Uh, they, uh, the, the judges and the European judges and US justices denounce the hypocrisy, the false neutrality and the majoritarian bias of the secular state in France as in the United States. In this context, um, here's our Justice Sotomayor's dissent, which was joined by the late Justice Ginsburg, and it's worth quoting, I'll quote it very quickly. Uh, and by the way, for those who want the full quotes that I'm using in this presentation, plus a short bibliography, I'd be delighted to send them 
a, a PowerPoint that includes the full quote, the exact references, and, uh, and the bibliography if, if they want it. Uh, quote, the United States of America is a nation built upon the promise of religious liberty. Our founders honored that core promise by embedding the principle of religious neutrality in the First Amendment. The court's decision today fails to safeguard that fundamental principle. It leaves undisturbed a policy first advertised as, quote, a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States, end quote. Because the policy now masquerades behind a facade of national security concern, end quote. The policy masquerades behind a facade of national security concern. Now in Sarkozy and Macron's France, as in Trump's America, we're facing, I think, highly questionable legal decisions which hide an unpleasant reality. That is to say, the weaponization of religion for political purpose at a time when Islam is denounced as a dangerous threat to Western values. Yes, there is a danger, it's radical Islam, but uh, you know, there are, it's a complex phenomenon. Islam is made up of very different groups, very different traditions and values. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, to come back to French example, the rise of the COVID pandemic and the requirements of masking for all or the non-vaccinated made a mockery of the social, of the open face social interaction model that was supposed to be at the core of the French art of living together, of the French art of vivre ensemble. Masking one's face, of course, is unpleasant, uh, but it has not destroyed completely social interactions, uh, as we all know. In the United States, Sotomayor's Gisberg's uh, dissent in Trump versus Hawaii pointed to, I think, a new definition of modern tolerance. Tolerance is not just the full acceptance of minority faiths in a pluralistic society. It also involved what I would call define as the principle of hospitality. A tolerant society accepts foreign visitors irrespective of their faith and national origin. It may of course restrict uh, the duration of their stay with visas, for instance, or define special conditions for family reunification and political asylum, but it cannot prohibit their entry, their entry without compelling uh, reasons. So a word of conclusion. The secular state at the end of the 18th century, of the 20th century, and beginning of the 21st, uh, it's the secular state did not prohibit the presence of religious symbols in the public square. It regulated their presence according to well established principles of state neutrality, tolerance, and religious pluralism. But the rise of nationalist and populist ideologies in France, the United States, Belgium, Switzerland, had the unfortunate consequence of purging, I would say, the public square of certain religious symbols or foreign visitors in Trump's America considered too foreign, too radical to be compatible with the dominant norms of Western society. These ideologies introduce a majoritarian bias. Tocqueville would have said uh, a tyranny of the majority. Uh, uh, that is to say a perversion of modern tolerance, stigmatizing without a, openly saying so religious minorities and in particular Muslims. But one should never forget that Muslims were not, are not the first immigrants considered too foreign to be assimilated into American society, for instance. I mean, Irish, Chinese, Italian, Japanese, Jews, Mexicans, many other groups were not always welcome in the United States. We should not forget that. But that did not prevent them, in the end, from being rather successfully integrated in a remarkably inclusive with the people. Sometimes it took a long time for non-mainstream religious groups to be tolerated, let alone welcome and respected for their positive contribution to society. Uh, in fact, the treatment of Afghan refugees in this country and in Europe will offer yet another test of our commitment to the values of 
tolerance and pluralism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denis. Uh, uh, thank you for the for that talk. Uh, a long number of questions have have come up. One of the questions uh, raises this matter of what's so special about religion. So we talk about tolerance and we talk about religious tolerance. And you mentioned uh, 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 Cecile Laborde and her recent work calling into question whether or not, as I understand it, religion is a viable category. I mean, this is an old argument. Uh, some people would say that, um, that religion doesn't require such a special uh, 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 protections and that other kinds of conflicts uh, should be treated on the same level. So the question is, you know, what's so special about religion? And I'll read the, one of the questions that came in, which is pertinent to this. This is from Avi Rosenzweig. Isn't othering, isn't othering for various purposes a fundamental activity of social life? And if so, therefore, perhaps making distinctions of confession or faith or religious practice are less terrible than other criteria like ethnicity or wealth. Can you comment on the lesser of two evils argument about secular conflict in the face of other more severe social conflicts? Yeah, well, let me um, maybe explain why I wrote the, the, the book, The Limits of Tolerance. Um, when I started uh, reflecting on the notion of tolerance, uh, what was fashionable at the time, still is, was to denounce uh, what I call multicultural tolerance and intolerance. I mean, uh, tolerance was uh, in the 60s, 80s, 70s, was really about tolerating, uh, uh, or should we tolerate uh, gays? Uh, should gender be disputed? Uh, and and uh, what about intolerance there? And that was before the time when gay marriage was accepted. And, uh, and that was also a time when religious tolerance was forgotten. I mean, the idea in the 80s and, and, and um, uh, early 90s was that there's no problem with religious tolerance. I mean, it's been solved. Uh, it's not the key problem. The key problem is modern issues of uh, othering uh, gender and, and so on. So that was striking me. And Suddenly, when we thought that those were the key issues and the key areas where tolerance should be debated, suddenly everything changed again with uh, Rushdie's uh, satanic verses and uh, Rushdie's uh, uh, denounced by Ayatollah Khomeini who wanted to, him killed and, and his translators. So suddenly religion, which didn't seem to be central anymore because the problem had been solved, came back in the present as a key thing which could be dangerous and violent. Uh, and, and that was the, um, uh, the crisis introduced uh, by Salman Rushdie's novel and, and the decision, the attempt to kill him, uh, which failed, but uh, um, which, which struck my attention. So I, I thought it was time to go back to another reflection on religious tolerance, knowing that there's other variants, problems of tolerance, but I didn't want to deal with all of them at once. It would have been too vast a domain. So uh, for me, what was interesting is the resurgence of religious intolerance at a time when we thought that there was no problem with religious tolerance. The real problem was with gender identity and other issues. I have another question. Uh, this one comes from uh, Jonathan Sheehan. He says, it seems to me, and maybe this is your point, that the Swiss ban on minarets is quite consistent with the Italian and French rulings, since I would assume that no one in positions of political and legal authority, not to mention the wider community, would be persuaded that Islam is essential to the foundations of Italian or French civilization. For that reason, it seems to me that non-Christian symbols in public spaces could only be understood as provocations. And therefore, according to the principle of living together, should always be restricted. So I can't see how you get 
to a presumably desirable inclusivity when minority religions cannot make their civilization claims that the courts are so comfortable making for Christianity. Your thoughts? I, I think it's a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, I didn't think in those terms of similarities between uh, the three systems, but indeed, uh, whatever uh, is uh, the pro seems to be or appears to be a monument that advertises a minority immigrant religion against what's left of the old dominant religion. Uh, yes, there are, there are surprising similarities there. The Swiss also banned the veil in the, uh, uh, in, in the public space recently in the, in the referendum. So they're very, their position is very close to, to that of the French. Uh, the Italian, it's, it's more complicated because they are maybe more successful at preserving old uh, religious symbols of, of a uh, dominant, you, what used to be a dominant religion than the French. But the French, if you look beyond the surface, there are also many elements of Christianity that have been preserved by the secular state and which are not openly acknowledged today, for instance, in the French army, you have chaplains uh, and chaplains uh, paid for by the French state that uh, uh, would give a mass uh, for the Christian soldiers, would uh, allow them to, to be pilgrims in Lourdes every year. There's a uh, procession for French army officers in Lourdes. But in uh, uh, a desire to be really pluralistic, you also have Muslim chaplains uh, in the French army. And you also have a yearly pilgrimage to Mecca, which is uh, not financed by the French army or indirectly financed by the French army and organized by the French army. So here you have genuine pluralism, uh, which is uh, uh, developed and which suggests that uh, there are ways of being more tolerant than we claim to be. Uh, but those are small areas that are not terribly well known. What happened to the French army and how do they treat uh, minority religion? And that's important. That's where perhaps changes are taking place. Uh, but you also have, uh, when I looked at a question of crash in the United States and in France, the French legionnaire, the Légion, uh, the traditional uh, uh, military corps have, uh, have their own crash. So whenever there are in, uh, say Mali or, 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 uh, or Iraq or even Afghanistan, at Christmas time, you have soldiers building their little crash with uh, baby Jesus, Mary and Joseph, and, and then little toys representing their tanks, their cannons and the site where they are. So that you have a strange mix of, of religion with secular values, which is bizarre in a way, and, and which affects the most secular of all institution, the French army. So far, we've been talking mostly about <clears throat> easily recognized religions like Islam and Christianity. We have a question uh, about France, about uh, sort of less conventional religions. This is a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. But how does tolerance look like for new cults, for the new age type religions in France? Does France have legal regulations regarding these kinds of outfits? Yes, there is um, uh, a France in that case is much more restrictive than the United States. Uh, there is a special institution that looks at new cults and tries to ban them or make their life very difficult. But um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's in fact denounced as a yearly uh, State Department report on religious freedom in the world. And France is always a target on the fact that it's mistreated, mistreating this and that new uh, cults. Uh, the main reasoning in France is that, is there, um, do you have, in, in, if you belong to a new cult with a, a powerful guru, do you preserve the right to pull out of that religion or not? And if there's indication that your mind could be manipulated in such a way that you will never leave or uh, the organization, then there's a problem. And, uh, and that's not religion, that's a problem of excessive use of force against the faithful. Uh, 
So for instance, Scientology is not recognized as a religion in France uh, because of that. It is in the United States. Other cults are, uh, Jehovah's Witness had a lot of problem in France, no longer is the case. Uh, Mormons were not always well treated in France. That's also is changing with becoming more pluralistic, but there is an, a little organization that checks on the, on the cults and whether they are dangerous for individual members of the cult or not. And here the key thing is, do you keep uh, the possibility of living your religion? If you cannot, there's a problem. Uh, is, uh, are, are your financial resources totally absorbed by the cult uh, without your um, ability to say no, there's a problem also. And the new law that passed in July against uh, um, uh, defending the values of the Republic looks at the foreign financing of, of, uh, uh, of religion in France uh, and makes it stricter. You have to reveal the name of donors, for instance, the target of Islam, but I got a letter from the uh, Anglican Bishop of Paris, who is also very concerned because it's a law that concerns not just Muslims, but a religion where donors are important uh, and finance is an important question, and they may be uh, unbalanced by that uh, requirement of opening the finance, the financing. Uh, for Muslims also, the risk, you know, if you reveal that so-and-so uh, in Turkey or Saudi Arabia is financing your mosque, are you going to lose the right to function as a a religious uh, association in France, and that's being questioned today. There's also an, another interesting thing in the, the new law that's quite repressive, the new law to defend the value of the Republic, uh, that's after the murder of Samuel Paty, uh, a French um, college school teacher who had uh, shown uh, caricature of Mohammed to his students and then was murdered uh, by someone who came from Chechenia. Uh, but after he had been outed by, uh, on the internet as a, someone who was a, a dangerous person. And as a new provision now that sanctions the revealing of private identity of individuals on the internet, that is to say their name, their address, and insults them for, for different reasons. And if that takes place now, you can be condemned as a sanction for that. Uh, and uh, uh, significant uh, uh, fees can be imposed on, on the platform. So uh, it's all a, a moving area with, uh, you know, in some areas, tolerance seems to be growing. In others, it seems to be diminishing. And it's true that for minor minors, new cults, new, uh, new religion, uh, uh, the friend, new religions than the United States. I'm going to insert myself into the queue here and ask a question, Denis. <clears throat> I'd like to hear you talk more about um, what happens in the United States in the 1940s. I mean, this is when the Jeffersonian concept of the wall comes in and the Supreme Court in Everson and a lot of other cases really all the way through the 40s and 50s and 60s creates um, a very distinctive First Amendment jurisprudence. And that's interesting because here we have uh, a history of uh, ever since the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, where we've had this secular constitutional framework, but yet uh, most observers I think would agree that you had a kind of uh, informal Protestant establishment. So a lot of the public schools, uh, Protestantism was sort of taken for granted. You had Bible reading, uh, you had uh, clergymen that were brought in, and later uh, Catholic churches uh, abide, uh, follow the same practice. So you have release time so that Catholic priests are able to come in and uh, uh, teach their the Catholic students. So you have a whole history whereby there's a kind of uh, of of uh, Protestant cultural hegemony. And then in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, uh, that changes. And these court decisions allude to the First Amendment and imply a history of religious freedom, which is then um, being challenged 
uh, and that the, the democracy is being damaged by religious sectarianism in the 1940s, even though there's been a lot of religious sectarianism all the way through. Now, would it be possible to say that the new First Amendment jurisprudence of the 1940s and 50s and early 60s is in itself a form of secular intolerance? Or are we instead uh, supposed to see this as the way in which a liberal democracy's constitutional order adjusts itself to a more diverse society, to a society that is no longer so overwhelmingly Protestant and therefore stretches things a little bit? Or is there some other way to look at this? How do you see the First Amendment jurisprudence of the 40s and 50s and 60s? Well, uh, what, what strikes me, you, you, you briefly mentioned Everson. That's, that's a good example. On, on um, The key point of that jurisprudence is the uh, incorporation doctrine. Uh, after all, you know, the Establishment Clause originally only applied to the federal, uh, federal government. And that jurisprudence applies using the uh, 14th Amendment and the incorporation doctrine, applies it to all the states. Right. So suddenly, many states that had uh, 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 certain arrangement with local churches or privileges right. local churches are uh, have to accept in a more direct way the Establishment Clause. And, uh, uh, and, and so uh, the principle of separation of church and state becomes more important and, and, and better enforced, but there are many ways to, uh, to go beyond it, uh, I would say. So it's not just jurisprudence, but also uh, that jurisprudence could have been contradicted by the, the parliament, by the Congress. And I think a good example of that are the, uh, the you know, the uh, European are always shocked that um, the, the motto uh, in God we trust or uh, under God in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, for them, it's an example that the United States is not really a secular country, but they don't realize that uh, those uh, uh, under God and the national motto in God we trust were passed by the Congress during the Cold War under the um, Eisenhower administration to signal to the arch enemy, Russia at the time, atheist Russia that we were Christian nations and they were not. And it was good to remind every student in the morning that they belong to a Christian tradition. So uh, it's a mixing of politics and religion in the time of the Cold War. And it's a very, very late development. And of course, most Americans don't realize that, for instance, Jefferson, when he was president and had some free time, did a cut and paste and wrote the so-called Jefferson Bible, which is a, a very interesting secular um, cut and paste of the Bible where he uh, re cuts all references to miracles, to um, uh, the uh, resurrection of the Christ and all of that. And it transformed Christ into a kind of a philosopher, a kind of Socrates. And the end of the Jefferson Bible which has been republished by the Spithonian, by the way, in a beautiful edition. The end of the Jefferson Bible is that uh, uh, the death of Jesus, uh, Joseph de Arimathea comes, roll a stone in front of Jesus' tomb, period. That's the end. And uh, we should never forget that in the United States of the 30s, whoever was newly elected in the Congress got a free copy of Jefferson's Bible. And that stopped in, I think, 36 or 38. And no one would dare do that uh, today. And today, I'm afraid Jefferson would never be elected a president in a country that remains quite religious. And also a country, surprisingly, which, in which the majority of the justices of the Supreme Court are Catholic. Uh, it's no longer a Protestant country. It's a Catholic country, at least uh, if you consider uh, the elites that are uh, uh, at the... Uh, at the Supreme Court. This is an unusual development. I mean, Catholics may have become more conservative, maybe closer to Protestant. There's more an alliance between Catholic and Protestants, of course, in the United States today than in the 40s. But that's an interesting shift. And, and religion remains quite 
central uh, to, to many of the debates you, you have in the United States. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you talk about those, those developments of the 50s, not only the court decisions, but uh, <clears throat> the Congress's uh, adoption of, uh, of in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, you know, under God and the in God we trust as the national motto and Eisenhower's comments about, uh, about uh, religion being very important. It struck me as very interesting that <clears throat> the effort to amend the Constitution to put God and Jesus in it, which has come up from time to time throughout American history. But in 1954, it was a strong effort by evangelical Protestants led by the National Association of Evangelicals and people at Fuller Theological Seminary and so forth to do this. And it was uh, discussed in the Senate of the United States, the Flanders Amendment. And it was gonna read that the United States acknowledges uh, that all our, all our values come from God and we acknowledge the, the, uh, the, the, the leadership of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> 17 Jewish organizations protested this. So there's a big fight about it. So at least at that time, there was some distinction made as though religion in general is okay. And it's, it's all right to have you know Christianity and these other kinds of stuff, but we don't wanna actually build Christianity right into the constitution. That's a, a sign of where there was a, the struggle that you're talking about in the Cold War. There were at least some limits as to where they could go with it. But look, we're almost out of time and I have one more question in the queue, which I wanna to go to before we close down. This is a question from Jocula and Adams. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Could you please elaborate on your understanding of how we might explain uh, intolerant secularism in the case of France or Switzerland today? Well, th this, um, there's a, in France, a, a tradition of uh, a central state that controls a lot of things, what I call centralization. And the fact that religion, but not just religion, it could be uh, uh, identity groups, uh, it could be uh, um, uh, different communities, challenge the central authority, uh, represent a, the possibility of a different society or a different ideology, which is not that of the government, is, is considered threatening. I mean, what's, uh, it, it's hard to understand for Americans and some Frenchmen, uh, the incredible fear that multiculturalism represent in France. The idea that multiculturalism is separatism. It's, uh, it means that you, you, you don't have a true allegiance to the dominant ideas. And, and so there's that fear and, and it's linked to something which I think is uniquely American and quite interesting when you observe it, the ability of Americans to have dual or multiple allegiance. I mean, you could be, uh, a, a, you know, a true patriotic Irish, but at the same time, a very patriotic American. Uh, you could be very attached to your Jewish culture and, and still be uh, uh, a patriotic uh, American. And this ability to have multiple allegiance, which was beautifully theorized by Horace Callan, for instance, uh, the inventor in many ways of multiculturalism when he criticized Zangwill's melting pot is, is there. It's, it's this capacity to consider the individual or the identity of an individual as multiple. And I think it's a plus in a society. Whereas in France, because of a very old centralist maybe Catholic or maybe Jansenist tradition, the idea that the individual would be multiple, would have multiple identities at the same time is, is harder to think, even though in many ways, uh, France or Belgium or Switzerland are countries of immigrants. Uh, we've had a lot of Polish and, and Italian and, uh, and, and immigrants in France as well, but it's not framed in the same term. So there is this ability for multiple allegiance, which is not shocking to Americans. And in France, it's considered, if you have a multiple allegiance, it, you're considered uh, to be maybe a traitor or someone who's not really attached to, to the nation. And, and uh, another reason for this, um, and typically French anxiety, I would say, is the competition between the supremacist right, Le Pen, and traditional political parties. And one way to, to try to limit the impact or the influence of Le Pen uh, 
is to try to steal some of our uh, ideas to pretend that uh, you know, you're more secular and more strict than, than she is. And she's now trying, Le Pen is trying to pretend that the party of freedom and the party of secularism is uh, the extreme right. Uh, um, so we have this strange politicization of, of debates that are fundamentally not political at first. Well, thank you. And you're actually uh, giving me good reason to feel a little bit more patriotic about the USA, and I've been looking for reasons to feel that way recently. So I thank you for that. And I thank you also for your lecture as a whole and for coming here. We had originally wanted this to be in person, of course, but we've had to switch because of the pandemic uh, restrictions here at the last minute. So I'm going to close the session down now, and we don't have a way to applaud. But I think uh, everybody who's on this appreciates your lecture as I do. So I will close it down and thank you very much. Thanks.